You're now listening to Mark Who 42 from the Hooniverse and beyond. Reading is fun, but I know a lot of you out there don't have a lot of time to spare to read. But you do drive your car to go from place to place, and that's why you should get audiobooks. Audiobooks like the ones they have at Audible. Hi, I'm Mark Baumgarten, host of Mark Who 42. If you are interested in reading fiction, nonfiction, Doctor Who titles, Audible has 180,000 titles, actually more than that, for you to choose from to get your reading done in an auditorial fashion. Go to audibletrial.com slash markwho42 and get a free month's membership plus a free download. And you can download any audiobook that's on their site. So go to audibletrial.com slash markwho42 and take advantage of this free offer if you enjoy your audiobook you can stay with them and only pay $14.95 a month you'll get another download and you'll be again a member of them where you'll be able to get low rates on audible books so once again go to audibletrial.com slash mark 42 and read or rather listen that's a good doctor who phrase listen Hi, this is Victoria Price. I'm Vincent Price's daughter and the author of The Way of Being Lost, and you're listening to Mark Who 42. Welcome to Mark Who 42. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten, and with me today are... Patricia Fryer. And the return of Zion Kuros. Yes, yeah, Zion, welcome back to the team. Oh, yeah. this show is going to be a really good show. I see this show being one of our best shows. You know why? How come? Because we've got Victoria Price as our guest. Victoria Ooh. Price, the daughter of the late great Vincent Price, and we'll be talking to her about herself and about her father. And we'll be talking, covering all of the Vincent Price stuff that you've wanted to know about or to learn. We're going to have it for you. But first, you know what we're going to go to? Mark 42 News with your anchor person, Zion Kiros. Zion. Hey, I finally get a crack at this for once. Yeah, Zion. All right, All right so first on, on the list, has anyone heard of George Romero? Yeah, I know George Romero. He's, he's that uh, independent filmmaker who did Dawn of the Dead and, the and, Dead. and, and Night of the Living the Dead. Zombie Guy. And Day of the Dead. Uh, a lot, <laughs> the Zombie yeah, Guy. I, I know who George <laughs> Romero zombie is. Guy. Land the of the Dead. Guy. I, I know who he is. <laughs> Okay, so his daughter is apparently making a zombie film. Shut the front door. <laughs> so, so the the movie is called Queens of the Dead, and it is a homage to her late father as well as mashups of new elements that are pretty much her her own thing. She pretty much can't say much about it, but what she said is that what I can tell you is that this film will have all the hallmarks of a George A. Romeo classic. Wow. Bars, politics, heroes, a-holes, and most importantly, herds of silly and slow-moving walkers that you can't help but love. <laughs> but I'm doing it Tina-style, bringing the glitter, choreography, and queers and queens. Cool. I've never actually watched a George Romero film. You've How, never like, watched the Living Dead films? No, I am not a zombie person besides right. reading The Walking Dead, in, in all honesty. I haven't seen any of them either. I haven't even seen Walking Dead. That's how much I'm not into zombies. <laughs> Everyone keeps telling me, oh, it's not really about zombies. I don't care. Well, I don't it's about it. the people and how they survive <laughs> in a world where there are no rules anymore. And I've read the comic. I've seen a few episodes, and it, it, it is a good show. And Chris Harrelson is one of the walkers in there, and he's a friend of the show, and we've had other people from the show on. But what's cool about Night of the Living Dead was that it was a commentary on racism. And what's cool about Dawn of the Dead was it was a commentary about mass media and the way it affects the 
overall system of the world. So his movies have had meanings. None of them are strict zombie films. They all have a reason behind it, and the zombies are just there for the enemy, I guess you would put it. Right. Yeah. So they they are good films. And Night of the Living Dead is so not gory. I mean, the gore in it is so ridiculous. You should just at least watch Night of the Living Dead. Good film. The original. Oh, don't want the new film. It was in the 60s. It was oh, wow. In the 60s. And uh, Dawn of the Dead was early 70s. It starts off taking place in a TV studio where they're doing a debate on some subject. And then it ends up the rest of the film takes place in the shopping mall that the humans have barricaded them inside to stay away from the zombies, and the zombies break free. So it's a commentary on capitalism as well, and they really are good movies. And, you know, the zombies move slow, so, you know, it's kind of, and there's a lot of gunplay, so it is exciting as well as informative. Essentially, from what I'm gathering from this, is that it is pretty much where all these zombie tropes of today came from. Yeah, yeah. He is really the father of the modern zombie film and television show, George Romero. So I can't wait to see what Tina Romero is going to make. And I'm definitely going to go and watch that one. Definitely will look into it myself as well. Yeah. Moving to Living Force, the final season trailer for Star Wars Rebels dropped on the 19th. Mm-hmm. And this is, of course, the final one, so they have to always pull on the heartstrings and whatnot. So the trailer opens up with a lot of flashbacks to uh, the previous seasons. That's like mm-hmm. Urza meeting um, the crew of the Ghost and whatnot, going on meeting what will eventually be the Rebellion as we know it in the original Star Wars trilogy. And essentially, this is going to just wrap up the entire bridge between episode three and episode four and at the end of this we can finally see our great lord and savior emperor palpatine oh wow talk with urza a a little bit in there i've been waiting for this whole series to end just to see how it ends because i know that there's no way to to keep all these people alive because it's kind of a whole bunch of continuity problems well i'm glad that they brought thrawn into star wars rebels because and and i know he's in the the uh advertisement that we're talking about Yes, he uh, so he is in the final six episodes. I, I think it's great because Timothy Zahn created such a great character in Thrawn in the book series that are now, you know, Star Wars legends and don't count, but he got to bring them back in the novel Thrawn so that he is canon with the Disney Star Wars. And now that he's appeared in Rebels, it's even more. Yeah, of course, we know that Thrawn dies in the um, Legends stuff, so of course he's he's going to die here without the continuity error just born up in, in our oh, faces wait a minute, and whatnot. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, why does Thrawn have to die? Thrawn doesn't have to die. He, he can live through the Death Stars blowing up. In fact, that would be a great place to pick up that well, after, the, you know, when the Emperor Thrawn does a little uh, more damage to the New Republic. If Thrawn didn't die before... Star Wars, right? Mm-hmm. He would have been in Star Wars on. Well, on they didn't the, have the, the they didn't have the, the character. Part. You can't retcon. So I, 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 but I don't think he needs to die. For Conway's sake, I respectfully disagree, but I okay. understand where you're coming from. And also, I still see that Rex is still alive. How <laughs> is a clone still? Alive? See, this is the part that still throws me off. Is that yes, he he is old and whatnot, and people say that Rex is the same old guy in Return of the Jedi from the Battle of Endor. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of things that I... Essentially, everyone just needs to die before this whole plot hole just... Well, I mean, everyone died in Rogue One. Spoiler alert. Um, (laughs) (laughs) How dare you? I'm sorry. I haven't even seen the new Star Wars, so you tell me anything. You haven't? Not yet. I just went out for the fourth time yesterday. What's wrong with you? Uh, it, 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 you know, I haven't gotten to the theater. I, I'm going to see it. I have tickets for Regal Cinema. I'm going to see it. it. It'll be out for another couple of years, won't it, before it gets taken off and goes to DVD? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it already has a release date, so. Yeah. I think, I think in March or something. In March, so. I'll see it in yeah. February, so I'll be fine. <laughs> Trish, 
Now, I heard that you actually have a news item you want to bring up to this news report. Yeah. I, this was such a shock to me yesterday. Uh, I was scrolling through Facebook, came across the Nerdist, and they were showing a promo for Son of Dundee. I'm like, Son what? Son of Dundee. Yeah. So, of course, I had to click on it. And That's called clickbait. Yes, and I thought, but I thought Nerdist, you're not going to steer me wrong, right? You know. Yeah, <laughs> so, they are. But... That's why you listen to Mark Who Forty Two because Nerdist steers you wrong all the time. No, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> we steer you right. Yes, but we steer you to the so to I the go. All... No, we don't do that. <laughs> we do not do that. Uh... Tell us about Son of Dundee, Trish. Okay, so it's a new Cardell Dundee movie. But without his long lost son, it's a son he didn't know he had because it's not the same son from that atrocity that was what Crocodile Dundee in LA or whatever. I never saw it. I never saw it because I heard it was so bad. But um, it's a son that he doesn't even know about. He's apparently American Mm -hmm. and he's being played by Danny McBride. No. Oh. Yes. So you got Danny McBride and, and Paul Hogan together. Well, Paul Hogan is, they're thinking his part is kind of going to kind of be like Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker in Force Awakens. Like, we're just going to get him at the end because oh. Crocodile Dundee gets kidnapped. And oh. he and so his son has to go find him in the why Australian would wanna, Why would you want to find Crocodile Dundee? What's I don't point? know. <laughs> but I'm just like. What is, I mean, I hadn't heard this through the grapevine on anything, you know, like, it's like such a, just, I don't know, just like, what the hell happened, you know, I mean, who thought this was a good idea? Now, now, now it's interesting, (laughs) it's interesting you bring up the fact that there was a Crocodile Dundee in LA, I didn't even know that movie existed, I thought there was Crocodile Dundee and Crocodile Dundee 2. I didn't which know are they both, made anymore. Which I like both of those yeah, a those lot. Good. I really like both of them. And uh, But then there was one. Let me look it up. I'm going to look it up because it's going to drive me crazy. While she's looking it up, let me tell you a little story, folks. Paul Hogan was the Australian Benny Hill, at least in my mind. W.O.R. Oh. in New York, after they played the Benny Hill show at 11 p.m., and this was in the early 80s, would then play the... Um, Paul Hogan show. And I used to watch it and it was funny. I was a little kid. Yeah, one of the things they brought up was that, you know, actually Danny McBride would have fit really well into that show. Yeah. You know, so it's like similar humor, so it might work. But um Crocodile Dundee, Dundee, the first one came out in eighty six, then the mm-hmm. second one was in eighty eight, and then Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles was in two thousand one. Now, see folks, so, there's a gap it was there. There's a reason thirteen for that years. Gap. There's a reason for that gap. They didn't <laughs> there's a reason for the guy. And, and there's a reason he came back. It's called Kaching. And, and I don't think it made much. Do you know how ka-ching. old he is? Oh my gosh. Oh, Paul hell. Hogan is. He's. Guess how old he is. I would say Paul Hogan is in his 70s. I'm going to take a guess and say 65. He's 78. Thank you. Wow. So I, I he's, on the, he's on the. He's on the. He's on the. On the far end of the 70s. Yeah. So. No, but I, I, I buy yeah. that. I buy that very much. But Paul Hogan, very funny guy. I hope this movie works for him. Maybe they can make a new Son of Dundee franchise. Maybe I can walk off the edge of a cliff. One of those two could happen. <laughs> I don't know. Or none of them could happen. I, I really don't know. Do we have any more news, Mr. Zion Kiros? Not at the moment, but... Yeah, I no want Doctor to, uh, Who news dropped, really, this week. This well, past week. you know what today is, though, right? Today? Sunday, 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 Sunday! Yeah, Sunday. Do you mean Sunday, or do you mean Wednesday when this is airing? Oh, I guess whenever we're recording. Well, um, or yesterday, actually. No, yesterday. Well, Tom it was yesterday. Baker had Tom his Baker's birthday. birthday. Yeah, we, we yeah. posted his picture around, and there are a lot of people liking it or loving it and writing comments. It's pretty cool. Since Patricia has seen The Last Jedi four times, and, uh, and I've seen it three times, I just would want to know your overall thoughts about it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've seen it four times. I, I uh, kind of uh, like it. Kinda, yeah, she, <laughs> it means she kind of liked it. She wouldn't have seen it past the third time if well, she hated it. <laughs> I like it 
more every time I love it more wow. every time I see it. Like I saw it yesterday and again I'm just sitting there in the theater the whole time watching it, completely enthralled, not now, distracted by anything else going on in the theater. I am just drawn, sucked in and enjoying every minute of it and just marveling every time just how much I love this movie. And I, at I the end a, of it I'm just like, I can't wait to watch this again. I have a question <laughs> for you, Trish. Mm-hmm. If Eddie wasn't there. Would you have seen it the four times? Eddie's only seen it three times. I've seen it four. Okay. So. Well, mm. that's good. Okay. No, I, I thought it, I thought Ed would have seen it like fifty times by now. <laughs> so, Zion, what are your thoughts? I mean, did you obviously um, seen it three times? So, oh, the first time I saw it, I, I don't know how I felt about it, so I decided to go see it two more times in in two days, that's and upon. Yeah. You didn't know you liked it, so you paid to see it two more times. Yes. So, like. That's how Disney makes its money, folks. Don't ask me how this works. Say that one more time, and I'll make sure that they don't, that, that they don't get another cent. Yeah, but, um. <laughs> hey, like, I'm um, going to go see Avengers 4, so they're going to make some money that way. So, there you go. But, um, or three and four, whatever it is. I don't know. Overall, I feel like it's, it, it's a Star Wars film, but, like. I like the best way I could describe it is take Star Wars as a hamburger, right? Mm -hmm. And this hamburger has a secret sauce that separates it from all the other hamburgers. And then this one hamburger comes out and it's missing the secret sauce. It still has a hamburger. You're eating a Big Mac, but they forgot to put the special sauce on it. Yes. Okay. It breaks the mold of the Star Wars franchise, is what I like about it. So it's it's Mm -hmm. actually a original movie. Is what you're saying. It's not a retread. Like, the reason I didn't like The Force Awakens that much was now, because see, it kind of used every single thing that they've already used before and put it in and repackaged it as Star Wars 7. Now, see, because there was a lot of... For you. There, yeah, it was meant to draw new people in, you know, because I, I, I know a lot of younger people that have not seen the original trilogy, which I know is like, I want to smack them upside the head and say, yeah. "What's wrong with you?" But you know, I'm, <laughs> no, 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 a lot of don't them. Argue, a lot discuss. of them grew up with. A lot of them grew up with the prequels. You know, I'm so sorry, so so sorry. <laughs> That's what they <laughs> had. And Return you know, Jedi is still the best movie. So I think mm. that they brought Force Awakens, and of course, the very first line of the movie is, "This will begin to make things right." Because <laughs> you know, okay. yeah, they gotta fix All right, this. I'm Go going ahead. to see it. I'm going to see it. And uh, then, maybe I'll see it this week. Well, like. But then, okay, so all these people complain about Force Awakens being just a rehash of Episode 4, and they're like, we want something new. Now, there's the same jerks that are complaining about Last Jedi, saying, oh, this isn't the Star Wars that we know and love, you know? And it's like, make up your first he's old! Alright. It's the same people that complained about Force Awakens, they're complaining about Last Jedi, that it's too different. They wanted something different, I thought. What's going on? This is just wrong. No. My, Everyone's got to complain. My whole quarrel can come down to two things. What? One being Luke, two being Rey. Mm-hmm. Luke, simply because... No, I do not like Return of the Jedi. I find it... You a don't very like Return movie. of the Jedi? Revenge of the Sith is an ultimately better movie than Return of the oh, Jedi. Oh, by far. oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Oh, those are fighting words. Here. Those are right. fighting. How old are you? He, I am twenty-one. Young. He's a very young oh, child. Oh, that explains he's a lot. Okay, okay. He's a no, child. No, 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 no. Phantom Menace is, is awful. Um, re, uh, Clone is awful. Lur. Well, I didn't Revenge like. I didn't really... like the second trilogy. There were some things in episode two and three that were kind of cool, but um, when they started with Phantom Menace and had Jar Jar, I was like, "What yeah, am it, I yeah, watching?" Get that. This but is like, totally for kids. Why am I still watching? That's but like, how I felt. Uh, but like, essentially, like, like when I went to go see the uh, the Last Jedi, and like Luke is pre- pretty much mimicking Obi Wan and Yoda how uh, how they went into exile after the Clone Wars and whatnot. But like, when it comes down to Luke, you know, but, Mark, you need to go see this movie so we can have an in depth discussion yes, because. Please. I know Zion's trying to dance around all, right, all, right, all the stuff you right. could say. I, I will try <laughs> to get to this movie, and, and maybe one episode that we do of Mark Who 42 
which of course is a Doctor Who show, we will discuss Star Wars in general. We will discuss the whole of Star Wars movies oh. so we can uh, get get this out of the way and never need to discuss it again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Until we're, go, the we're the Hooters movie. and Beyond. The we're, 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 the, I know, we're, we're Hooters and Beyond. Beyond. We're going to other galaxies, so this far, works far just away. fine. Okay. But we'll get into that after Mark sees this movie. After I see the movie. Well, that's all the news we have time for. This new segment of Mark Who 42 has been sponsored by Cosplay Convention Center. You can find more information by clicking the link on markwho42.net. They are a database for cosplayers, for anyone who works in a convention limelight. If you're looking for us, we're there. They have a database that narrows down where we're going to be. If you're looking for Doctor Who conventions in your area, this is a place to look. If you're looking for certain people going to conventions, you can find them there too. This database is amazing. And it's wonderful to use if you need to find out about your favorite genre, your favorite podcasts, your favorite professional cosplayers. Check out the Cosplay Guide. Again, you can find their link on markwho42.net. We're going to go take a little break. Get on one of those little breaks where we uh, get to drink because we're self-plugging or we're plugging away for other people for advertising. When we come back, we are going to have our very special interview with Victoria Price, the daughter of Vincent Price. We're going to talk all about her and her father. You're going to learn some things you've never known in this lovely interview that we do right after this here on Mark Who 42. Don't go away. Don't go away. We'll be back with more Mark Who 42 after this. Hello. Join the Nerdy Things Podcast with me, Kevin, my co-host, Jules, Heyo. and Tim. What up? Each week as we give our thoughts on the week's news about comics, movies, games, and all things nerdy. Then we dive deeper into the week's main topic. The things like time travel, cryptids, zombies, and blockbuster movies. Find Nerdy Things on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Iggy. Yes? You know, I know that you started watching Doctor Who as a newbie, you know, with the new show, but have you gotten a chance to watch all seven classic Doctors in action? I have not. Well, you know, you can find the most complete collection of Doctor Who ever broadcast in the U.S. on Retro TV. Shut the front door. Are you serious? I'm serious. And you don't even need cable for this. This is over-the-air television. You have an HD antenna. You can watch around the country Retro TV. Many of the stories have been remastered and enhanced from their original film and videotape elements, so they come out beautifully perfect in HD. Ah. Mind blown. It's free. You just have to go to your uh, TV and find Retro TV, and you can watch all the great Doctor Who. They show two episodes Monday through Friday, and they show more than that. I think I shall get my pajamas and my Ben and Jerry's then. And recently they've added new stories. Not new stories, as in, like, they made new stories, but new stories that they haven't had in rotation, such as several Patrick Trouton tales that weren't on before. They're adding them to them. So there's more to watch because, you know, those new stories became available web of fear and enemy of the Ooh. world so they've added things like that so, oh why i'm excited so don't <laughs> forget to go and look for retro tv and watch doctor who you can go to retro tv.com and look for their schedule for exactly when doctor who is on in your area i'm logging in as we speak Mark Who 42 is proud to have Famous Faces and Funnies as a sponsor of our show. They have literally tons and tons of comic books, novelties, and everything. They're located off of 3020 New Haven Avenue in West Melbourne. If you want to give them a call, let them Mark Who 42 sent you. You can call them at 321-258-3575. But they are a huge store. I mean, you've seen comic stores, but this one is kind of like the Costco of comic stores. They have tons of merchandise. It's incredible. You can go from one store, then there's another section and another section. They have tons and tons of stuff there for you to buy. If you have any geekdom out there, Famous Faces and Funnies has got it. 
Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Wars, everything. Rick, the guy who runs it, real great guy. You definitely want to check out Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida. Hi, this is Bruce Boxleitner, and you're listening to Mark Who 42. Welcome back to Mark Who 42 here on Krypton Radio. I'm Mark Baumgarten, your host with... Iggy Matthews, yes, Iggy. Yay! Yeah, and we have a guest for you. Uh, Our guest is the daughter of one of the, in my opinion, best actors and, among other things, in American cinema, Vincent Price. Her name is Victoria Price. Hello, Victoria. Hi, how are you guys this morning? We're pretty good. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the weather is beautiful out there. I'll tell you that. Uh, it's finally yeah. winter here in Florida, and it, it's <laughs> yeah, it is a frigid tundra here. Yeah. You're up in okay. Virginia. Yeah, where where, where are you? Uh, we talking to you from Victoria? I'm in uh, New York, the Hudson Valley, and there's about four inches of snow on the ground, so it's oh, beautiful. Wow. Wow. Okay, so I recant my previous statement, but it's still cold here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. Oh, goodness. No. My poor fingers. <laughs> Victoria, now a lot of people might recognize you. Uh, you. You are an author. You wrote a book about your father, but they might recognize you from HGTV. Yeah, I've made my living as a designer for um, over a decade, and I had the privilege of being on HGTV uh, on a wonderful show about a really cool project that I designed. It was an 1880s historic adobe chapel that we con- converted into a really cool modern living compound. So, so an adobe chapel? Yeah, it was in New Mexico, and uh, which has been my home base for the last 25 years. Mm-hmm. And it was built in the 1880s, three foot thick walls. And uh, I had the privilege of working with a wonderful husband and wife team in creating a space that reflected both of their interests. It was a, a real gift to work on that project with them. They would also know you because you were in one of my favorite movies, Edward Scissorhands. Yeah, I. Yeah. <laughs> I ran after Johnny Depp, and a friend of mine said, oh, my God, that's the fastest I've ever seen you run. I thought, yeah, right. Who wouldn't run fast after Johnny Depp? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my God. I think I would probably nail the role as well. Now, you played a newscaster in that movie, and unfortunately, it was your father's last film. Well, I actually would say fortunately it was my well, father's last for- Fortunately? Film. Okay. Okay. Why would, you, uh, why would that be? Well, you know, obviously, it would have been wonderful if his health had been good enough for him to do Tim Burton's next project, Mm -hmm. which was Nightmare Before Christmas, which Tim had hoped for him to do. But if we look at it in the scheme of of his his career, he had a 65-year career, and he went out in a movie that was written for him, and it was the perfect swan song. I will always, always be grateful to Tim for writing that part for him. You know, so many actors don't get that last wonderful role. And somebody who cared as much about his career as my dad did, to have Edward Scissorhands be his last role, honestly, it was a gift. So, yes, while, of course, you know, it would have been wonderful if he could have continued on and had even more of the kinds of roles that Christopher Lee was able to get with Tim, um, my dad had that role and what a gift that role was now your father was also an art expert and and tell me a little about the vincent price art museum in california oh i'd be happy to tell you about it so my dad fell in love with the visual arts when he was eight years old he bought his first work of art which was a first state rembrandt etching over three years from ages 12 to 15 using every penny of his allowance in a deal he made with an art gallery owner in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where he was from. Mm -hmm. And he studied art history at Yale and the University of London. And then he was dared to try out for a play and that's how he became an actor. But he remained an art lover and an art historian uh, and an art collector and a passionate arts advocate his entire life. And in the late 1940s, he began uh, a relationship a working relationship with an art teacher at East Los Angeles College, uh, a woman who was doing really innovative things in the community. And he wanted to support her, and he gave the graduation speech out there in the Mm mid-1950s. And my mom went with him 
And when she looked around, she had come to this country, she was an immigrant. And when she looked at the sea of faces in that student body, all immigrants, and she said, this is America. And this is where we need to give our art collection. So precisely because it is a school of first generation students who have come to America for the hope of creating lives, most of them uh, are Latino and Latina. Mm -hmm. She and <laughs> created an art collection uh, and it's been there since the 1950s. It's a school of 35,000 students a semester who go through that school. It's a hands-on art collection. But now even more exciting, the Art Museum, we have an incredible new director. And she's doing shows that are for underrepresented types of artists, artists who might be scorned by mainstream museums. And these shows are so powerful. Last week, our show that is currently there got written up in Art in America and the New Yorker. It was the New Yorker Instagram post. <laughs> one day. And so this dream that my parents had of giving art and giving the voice of art to underrepresented communities is now being recognized all over America as being so viable. And they would be over the moon with pride that this, this institution, the Vincent Price Art Museum, is representing the arts in, in a way that they probably couldn't have even dreamed of. It is incredible. And if any of your listeners get a chance to go out to Los Angeles and visit this museum, it's a gorgeous building. It's a $25 million LEED certified, architecturally beautiful Miami-based architectural firm created it. Mm -hmm. And it's across the street from a Carl's Jr.'s and it's right on the campus. So anybody can walk in for free and see amazing art. Well, I'm actually heading out to L.A. in February. Maybe I'll take a look at this place. We do. When are you going to be out there in February? Uh, I'm going to be out there for Gallifrey the, uh, the weekend of uh, President's Day. Awesome. Well, if you're out there February 20th, mm -hmm. I'm actually having a book signing in L.A. at Book Suit, my favorite bookstore in L.A., for my new book that's coming out. So uh, come by. and we can I, I would love to put my flight oh. on the 19th. I'm uh, going on the 19th. No! I'm <laughs> well, please do go out to the museum. You will love it. Okay. Thank you for the invite. Uh, so, Miss Price, I wa I'm just curious. When you're growing up this way and you're watching your dad, you know, as a kid, you, you never really can make sense of what it is that your parents are actually doing. You just know that I can only imagine a new piece of art showing up at the house and a lot of conversation and hustle and bustle. So how much art was just dispersed throughout the house or was there any at all? <laughs> it was so full that one time uh, the university of Indiana did uh, a show of 90 pieces from my dad's collection of drawings. And I came over one day, this was when I was in my twenties and, uh, and my dad was so excited because he's just gotten the catalog and I'm looking through the catalog and I said, how many pieces are in this show? He said, 90. I said, Oh my God, you can't even tell. I mean, there was so much art. He had this one closet that was just stacked to the gills with art and he would rotate everything. And from time to time, maybe once every two, three months, he would take everything out of that closet and look at it and decide what he wanted to go where. And it wasn't, you know, a collection of stuff to be admired. It was things that he loved. Wow. So it's like feng shui, but with paintings right. consistently. <laughs> exactly. I can only imagine like just trying to move out from a house and all the holes in the wall from shifting <laughs> the painting over here and then over here and then over there. I you know, it's just spackle in that house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine. Because I'm somewhat uh, similar when it comes to... Um, I have to I have to stop myself because we live in a tiny military house. So a lot of the times my husband has to be like, where exactly do you think you're going to put that? Like somewhere, right. somewhere over your head if you keep talking. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. I, I've worked with uh, many art collectors in, in my work as a designer and uh, I've had 
uh, art collectors say to me, you know, most designers don't understand this. They say, you know, that piece of art doesn't go with the sofa. And I had these one clients who said to me, you know, we just love our art and we know this is a small space. And the designer said, we just shouldn't have as much art. And I said, oh my God, are you crazy? And so I created this entire wall, like a Victorian salon, and it went all the way up the wall, the art, and they loved it. And that's the point. You know, there is this idea that there's good design and bad design. Yes, there is. But the bottom line is what you love to live with is more important than any of that. Yeah, absolutely. And personally, I would have said that the sofa doesn't go with the painting, but that's just me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Get rid of the sofa. Oh. Keep the painting on the yeah, wall. Exactly. You know, reupholster it, something. Exactly. Um, well, I, I've always believed that the most beautiful thing about art is that, um, in my personal opinion, is you get to see the best side of the human mind. Mm, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you get to see the most creative side. What is it that your beautiful mind can do? At what extent can you push it? And we get to actually get an illustration because every piece of work that comes out that a single person does comes from some point of memory or emotional something, something remarkable, something memorable, whether it was good or not. Absolutely. And it's being illustrated. And I think that that's beautiful. So what is your opinion of art in general when you look at it and how does it make you feel? I was an art historian, uh, an art history major, an art dealer. I still am a private art dealer. And when I was younger, my father would point out to me the things that he knew I loved as a person in paintings to get me to be able to look at art through the eyes of love. So when I was a little girl, and this still holds true, and I'm not a little girl by any means anymore, I loved dogs and horses. So any piece of art that had a dog or a horse in it, my dad would point out to me. And that would get me to really look at the art. But when I got into college, I thought that I had to approach art from my head. And so what I loved was German Expressionism, this very intense art, particularly from northern Germany. And a lot of it was protest art in protest of, of right. Yep. And I recently just saw a show of that art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was three rooms of just intense brutality. I mean, my shoulders were up around my ears. But in college, I thought, this is so powerful and intellectual and it appealed to my mind. So uh, the bottom line is that I had this intellectual view of art. But whenever I went to an art museum, I would find that I was sneaking off to look at things that I thought were, quote unquote, purely beautiful, as if that was like, some detrimental quality. I would find myself looking at a Dutch still life or a beautiful landscape or a, an abstract painting whose colors really resonated to me. And I felt guilty. They were like guilty pleasures. So cut to my late 40s and I'm invited to design a rug collection. And I decide to use works of art as inspiration for this rug collection. And I realized that all the works of art that I'm drawn to are all the ones that have been these guilty pleasures. So I ended up calling it my guilty pleasures rug collection because they were all pieces of art that I found beautiful. And all of a sudden I realized I had to own that I love beauty. I still am really moved by powerful statements. I'm really moved by deep character studies. My favorite painting in the world is a portrait by uh, the Spanish painter Velázquez of, of his assistant. What really moves my heart is beauty, and I had to own that. So at the end of the day, I think what matters in how we look at art is what moves our heart, whatever way it does it. And if we're thinking about art from our heads, I think we've missed the boat. That's not to say we shouldn't understand, seek to understand art, mm -hmm. but if we stay in our heads, we've lost it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. One thing that has always bothered me in going to museums is watching the crowd that just, you know, turns their head left and right and keeps walking. Um, I can't help it. Um, I've always told my friends that I'm the worst person to take to a museum just because I will stop at each and every individual uh, painting, read what it, you know, the short little history they have or information they have about the painting and I'll continue to look at it. And I'll always find something that stands out. And for me is the initial shock value. I go in with my heart and then I think. 
with it. And um, so definitely I can understand what you're saying with that because, I mean, me too, I went, I, I have my own little um, art thing going on and it's, I keep it very uh, personal because for me it's therapeutic. It's not something that I'm trying to share with others. The word you used were so perfect. We have to learn to think with our hearts. That's so yes. beautiful. I agree with that, actually. Yep. So, what was your father's take on art? Like, yeah, I'm what sure was he his probably. Style? Yeah, you know, I'm sure he probably sat there and you know spoke to you and like this this brushstroke or whatever. You know, a lot of people like to get into the details, but I'm I would love to hear what Vincent Price had to say when it comes to the emotional aspect of looking at a painting and then the thought-provoking process thereof. So what so was that I, like? My father's favorite artist was Goya, uh, the Spanish artist, and he felt that Goya had a way of capturing the essence of the human condition. But his favorite style of art were drawings, and style is maybe the wrong word, type of art, I guess, it were drawings. And the reason he loved drawings is he felt that drawings were a way of seeing the inner soul of an artist, and they were a way of really learning to understand how that artist thought from his or her heart. I just saw a wonderful show, an amazing show, of Michelangelo's drawings. I mean, room after room after room of Michelangelo's drawings at the Metropolitan Museum and in New York. And that show, it, I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, my dad would have loved this show because it starts from the drawings of his teachers and it goes on through the drawings of his assistants and surrogates uh, and even drawings of people who were influenced by him at the end of his life. But each of those drawings really shows you his process. And if you think about it, you know, uh, uh, it's like, I've just written this book. And what is pared down to a book was thousands of pages of journals and notes and notes to myself and chapters that got cut and are barely even present in some other form. And sometimes in that, there's a truth that maybe didn't get included in the book, but is still incredibly profound to me. But most of the time, the seeds of what we percolate through our processes surface over and over again in our writing, in our drawing, in our design, in our ideas, in our lives. And so to see the germination of those through drawings, my father just loved. So he loved all drawings. And I would say one of his prized possessions was a Renaissance cartoon for a fresco because frescoes were painted on ceilings. And basically these uh, pieces of paper were sort of plastered up on the ceilings and, and they were mostly destroyed. It was largely impossible to get them down intact. There was one in this Michelangelo show, but my father had an intact cartoon from a fresco. And it, I think there was part of that idea that they were ephemeral. He didn't want people to see that he things didn't just spring full form from the head of this genius. But a drawing is, is showing that we all have to go through the process. And, and that's something the world doesn't want a lot of people to see anymore. We all want to look so perfect. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's talk a little about your father. Now, uh, first of all, I want to mention you wrote a biography back in 1999 uh, of your father. Tell us about the process you went through for that. Well, it began with art. <laughs> it began with art, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, from the time I graduated from college till the end of my dad's life, we would work on and off on a project of essays about his life in the visual arts, because that was our shared passion. Mm -hmm. And toward the end of his life, a friend said to me, why don't you and your dad work on a book about art? And I said, oh, God, he'll never go for that. He never wanted to have his biography written. And I literally had half the sentence out of my mouth. I think, you know, I said, oh, this friend of mine thought we might work on a book about art. And I was all ready with my butt, blah, blah, blah. And he'd already said yes because he knew that he needed something to focus on. And so I have this really beautiful record of our conversations together because I taped them and transcribed them. And I actually don't know where the tapes are, but I do have the transcriptions. I wish I still had the tapes. It would be really... I, I wish you did too. I'd love to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day I'll find them in a box. There but, you go. Um, but the bottom line is that we did this book and then I went to New York to sell it and 
as my dad was dying, literally, like he died on my flight home from New York, um, you know, when I got, we got done with the process of, um, everything that had to do with his passing, I began hearing from publishers, why not instead of the book about art, why don't you write a biography? And I thought, oh God, you know, I don't like horror movies. I haven't seen all of his films. No child should write their father's biography, their parents' biography. But at the end of the day, I felt that I knew so much about what was most important to him and stories about the history of his life that nobody knew that I felt like if I didn't write this biography, then nobody would have that information. And of course, Anybody who really loves horror films could write about horror films Mm -hmm. much, much better than I could, but I can write about something that, you know, nobody else knows about. Yeah. Now, as I was doing some research for this interview, I came across something that I had absolutely no knowledge of. He played Simon Templer in The Saint on radio back in the 40s and early 50s. Because I loved uh, Roger Moore as the saint in, mm-hmm. on the British show. Um, did, did he like work with Keegan Radio, your father? Oh, he loved it. I think he thought of his voice as a musical instrument. He came from a very musical family, and he himself was a good enough singer to sing in the Yale Glee Club. Mm. But the bottom line is that he had this speaking voice that everyone remembers. Yeah. And he loved radio because on radio, your voice is the instrument. That's true. Yeah. And of course, the stories were so great on those radio. You know, you got to tell a story. He always felt that the human imagination, what we can do in our imagination, what we visualize is so much better than what is now shown in movies where we see everything. So the bottom line is he loved it. Now, the horror movies that he did, w- w- was he a fan of the genre or was that something he like, he did a horror film and he kind of got typecast? How, how did that work? How did he get into horror so greatly? It came about in a really cool way. Uh, in the 1950s, he was gray listed during the McCarthy era. During the McCarthy era, so many of his peers were blacklisted. They were branded as communists and basically lost. Some of them took their own lives. Many of them lost their life savings. Many of them had to flee the country. Goodness. But many, many more people were gray listed. And I've never heard that term before. Yeah, me either. <laughs> the studios were encouraged not to hire them. And so all of a sudden, my father, the lifelong actor and workaholic, was basically unhirable. Mm-hmm. And when he got his name cleared, he was offered two jobs in the same week. One was a play on Broadway called We're No Angels, which later became a very good movie with Humphrey Bogart. Mm-hmm. And uh, and my mom actually did the costumes for that movie. She was a costume designer. Okay. And uh, a movie with this new technology. And it had this cool story about an artist. And he thought, well, technology is what drives Hollywood. I'm going to take them movie and it was a little movie called house of wax and he Mm -hmm. it would become this iconic film you know a year later it was still showing in first run movie houses i mean that doesn't exist today if a movie comes out that is a huge hit and so that offered my dad in the 50s so many actors were like brando and james dean they were different kinds of actors and my dad was trained a classically trained actor with a beautiful speaking voice so to be able to play these villains these suave villains gave him a whole new career and he was grateful for it yeah and house of wax definitely the new technology 3d i mean you know you had a 3d movie so that's an exciting thing to be a part of i'm Absolutely. sure um. Now, oh, go ahead, Diggy. Oh, oh! You heard you oh, heard, heard the thought brewing in my. I heard head. the thought brewing. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, I've had this curiosity for a while now. Uh, what's with the baking powder? What's the story <laughs> behind that? <laughs> <laughs> the baking. Okay, the so baking powder. I, yes. Great, great, great. My great grandfather. Uh, was the first Vincent Price, my grandfather the second, and my father the third, and uh, my brother is the fourth, all Vincent Prices. And 
the bottom line is that my great grandfather was a homeopathic doctor in the 1800s and he couldn't grow a beard and mustache, which is ironic, right? Because Vincent Price had one of the most iconic oh, mustaches. Yeah. And beard. Mm-hmm. He just always looked like this kid and no one would hire him. So he has this, you know, homeopathy um, business and he's just killing time. So he starts experimenting, making something that will help his mother who has stomach issues and who makes these biscuits that were apparently like leaden and gave everyone a stomach ache. He's experimenting (laughs) with something to help them, you know, be a little more light and fluffy. And, uh, and that's right up here in the Hudson river Valley where I am now. And so he uh, invented baking powder. And then as many people did in that era, he went West to seek his fortune and he found a business partner and he created an early food empire. He was the first person to uh, patent extracts of vanilla and breakfast cereals. He even made dog food. And uh, he was a household name. He wrote four cookbooks. And when he died in 1916, the uh, Chicago Tribune called him uh, one of America's housewives, best friends. So that was the first Vincent Price. The second Vincent Price was his youngest son. And he ended up running the largest candy company in the United States and being head of the National Candy Makers Association. And his son, who was dubbed the Candy Kid, became the Vincent Price that we're talking about. Bit of a Willy Wonka air going yeah. on here. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know? and your dad wrote a cookbook too, didn't he? So it was another cookbook written. Yes, he wrote uh, four cookbooks. Four, they, oh, four, okay. So. The first one was hugely popular. It sold 350,000 copies when it came out in 1965. Mm-hmm. And when it went out of print, it became one of the top 10 most popular out-of-print books of any kind. Like wow. Mad- Sex, Stephen King, Erica Jong, and that cookbook, right? <laughs> so in, in <laughs> we issued the 50th anniversary edition of that cookbook uh, with a new preface by me and a new introduction by uh, Wolfgang Puck, oh. and who was a great Ooh. friend of my dad's. And it's an incredible cookbook, like this time capsule of food in the 60s and beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And now we've reissued two more cookbooks. This year we reissued... Cooking Price Wise, which was it contained some of my great grandfather's recipes, some of my dad's favorite recipes, and then a little cookbook he did in conjunction with a British TV sheer- series. And so that's Cooking Price Wise. And then a second one, which we reissued last year, was called uh, Come Into the Kitchen, which is all American recipes. So uh, three wonderful cookbooks that you can now get through Dover Publications. Wow. Books worth having. Yeah, oh, definitely books worth books. having. Uh, it, you know, Sever Magazine named that book that my uh, father and mother did as one of the 100 most important culinary events of the 20th century. It was one of the first coffee table beautiful cookbooks of its kind. People say it was aspirational, and I think it really was because it gave people an idea of something that they could do other than their same old, same old recipes or um, you know, eating TV dinners. And the bottom line is he was really the original American foodie, my dad. You know what? As if I wasn't already 10 pounds overweight, here we go. Let the binge begin. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, tell us about your dad, his obvious love of Edgar Allan Poe, because I mean, there were a lot of, he did the Raven, didn't he? Yes, a lot of Edgar Allan Poe. That was all with Roger Corman. Yes, Roger Corman, the, the late Roger Corman, yeah. And one of them in particular I want to bring up is, and you just mentioned it, The Raven. He got to work with Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre in the same film. Oh, and yeah. I, I, that, was, that was one of my, that's one of my favorite movies. It, it's so campy in, in certain ways, and, but, but yet still tells the story. Oh, well, you know, Campy was a part of my dad's... Uh, Egghead. <laughs> for sure. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I run a group with my uh, colleague Peter Fuller in London, and it's we jokingly call it Camp Vincent, but we lead people on cultural tours inspired by my dad's love of life. But I always think the double entendre of Camp Vincent is always kind of fun. And <laughs> he was. He was camp. Yeah. but. The bottom line is he had fun, and I think that's why it was campy. He was laughing through it and yet also taking it deadly seriously. And he loved doing that movie, and he loved working with Roger Corman. He also starred in The Last Man on Earth, which 
I, I have to say, I like much better than that Will Smith version of it. Because this is from the Richard Matheson novel, I Am Legend. Yes, and, and they were Will great Smith, the, That movie yeah. missed its mark. Vincent did it best, I think. Yeah, I think of the three of them. And there's often little polls, you know, which one did, did people like best, Last Man on Earth, Omega Man with Charlton Heston, or or uh, the Will Smith. And uh, a lot of people still really feel that uh, my dad did it best. So that's a nice thing. He definitely did. I shouted out while we were talking campy. I shouted out Egghead. Batman. <laughs> okay. B- Batman, one, uh, the 1960s version with Adam West. I mean, yes, people today love the dark Batman, but I loved the original the, the TV series Batman, and your dad played one of the best recurring villains, Egghead. Uh, <laughs> how did he get involved with Batman? So he, uh, you know, the bottom line is I was a surprise. I came along in the 60s when he was 51, and he wanted to do things that my friends would know, you know, what was the point of being this like old guy? He wanted to, you know, have a, a way to engage his childlike love of life. So everybody was doing things like Mod Squad and Get Smart and yeah. Batman. And he wanted to do all of those things so that he could feel like he was in with the in crowd. And of course, everybody wanted them him to do them because he was so fabulous to work with and, and talented. And so he was a villain. Why wouldn't he want to be a villain on Batman? Yeah. And he could be this silly villain, which was so great. And I think there are a lot of actors who might have thought, oh, you know, why would I do this? I, one of the things that my dad always did was take risks uh, he, he was invited to do the very first season of the Muppets and everyone was like, you're going to do a, what a puppet show. <laughs> and the bottom line is, of course, you know, the Muppets became iconic. My dad didn't wait till something became iconic to do it. He just thought whatever is fun, I'm in. So I'm kind of a history junkie myself. I can basically, uh, school anybody when it comes to a historical debate and my friends make fun of me because my infamous words always are well, technically. And <laughs> so I know by looking around that you do carry a little bit of history regarding the infamous boat, the Mayflower. So I want to know a little bit more about that. Well, it's really interesting and well, technically I don't, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but the whole time my dad al- was alive, we all thought we did. We thought we were descended from the first child born when the Mayflower landed, whose name was Peregrine White. And had I been a boy, I would have been Peregrine, which I, I think I've ended up living up to that name. I am somebody who I, I'm actually intentionally homeless. I live on the road. I do not have a, a, a traditional home. And uh, so I am a Peregrine. I'm a pilgrim. But the bottom line is when I did all the research and got in touch with uh, scholars of the Mayflower, although we could trace my ancestors back to like the 1200s, we couldn't trace them back to the Mayflower. Super early uh, people who came to the United States, but n- not uh, on my grandmother's side, on, on my father's mother's side. Uh, and my father's father's side, I always thought, and he always thought that they were Welsh because the last name Price is like Jones in Wales. And, mm-hmm. and I, I went to Wales and did a a show on the BBC there. And because the place I was doing the show is the home of the genealogical library for the United Kingdom, they paired me up with a genealogist. And about an hour before the show, the poor guy comes to me and he's like, I I can't find anything about your father and Welsh roots. And this has never happened to me. He said, do you have anything else? Anything you know about Wales? I said, well, my mother was born in Wales. He said, great. And he ran off and he found some stuff about my mother who actually is, you know, was born in Wales and this whole Welsh part of her family and, and all of that stuff. So he was happy. Two days later, he writes me back. He said, it was just bugging me. I couldn't stand it. You're not Welsh at all on your dad's side. You're Dutch. It was Debris, and it was then eventually translated into over time into Price, and they came as Dutch seekers of religious freedom. They were uh, immigrants who came to this country seeking religious freedom. 
Oh my God. That's almost more awesome though. I like, think I think it's really cool. I think that's awesome. I mean, there's nothing better than finding out your roots. Um, I mean, I remember doing the whole ancestry thing and, um, you know, kind of being a little bit scared and stuff and speaking with my parents and they're like, well, um, you know, cause you know, if you know any Latinos, you, you know, that the name is, it takes an hour to pronounce because there's like how many last names and middle right. names and whatnot. So it was definitely really interesting. You know, for me, I ended up finding out that I was more native American than I thought. Oh, that's and cool. yeah. So, I mean, honestly, that story sounds actually even more awesome than the whole ties with the Mayflower, but it's definitely one of those things where you, you get to identify really who you are, what's in your blood, your heritage. And yes. uh, it's, it's been fun. I had the opposite problem. You know, I, I kept wanting to find someone sort of uh, uh, interesting. I had all these Anglo Indian for uh, forebears, people who were English who lived in India. I thought, Oh, I've always been drawn to Hinduism. Maybe there's going to be someone Indian. No, I am like 900% Northern European. But um, really, really, couldn't I have like somebody interesting in there? But the run fun thing was the I've always wanted to go to Ireland. And my mother had nothing good to say about anyone I Irish. And when I finally got to Ireland, I was like, oh, my God, I love these people. These are my people. And every time I've gone to Ireland, I just have this like home thing about it. And my mother was always so disparaging. Well, I got a ton of Irish in me. And now I know why. So that made me happy. Well, you do come from a long line of strength, passion, and creativity, and that's definitely something to tip your hat over. Yes, no, I'm so. grateful for that, for sure. Now, uh, besides radio and movies, your dad also did a lot of college tours where he spoke out at colleges and did Halloween readings. Can you tell us how he got into that and how enjoyable it was for him to be able to meet the people really be there once again it started out with art oh wow this is everything goes back to art wow yeah he That's loved beautiful. the visual arts and he saw himself as an advocate for the arts and so his goal in going out initially were, was twofold one was he wanted to be an advocate for local arts organizations and museums and also use his celebrity to help open people's minds to contemporary art, to American art. So many of his early talks were about art and going out and talking to audiences. But he quickly realized that a lot of the people in the audiences were young people who wanted to live creative lives. And he realized that if he could do two things, he would be able to support them. One was, if he could, as Vincent Price, who was actually voted the actor most respected by American housewives in the 1980s, <laughs> If he could be that, you know, Yale-educated household name uh, actor, and he could say to these parents who are worried about their children being, you know, living creative lives, how could they go off and try to be actors or writers or artists? They should stay home and work in the family business. If he could be that advocate, it might be a way of supporting the artist. But also, he would give them tickets to his lectures. He would send them postcards from museums. He would commission works of art for them. And he did this with numerous young people. He never didn't take time after any, any talk. And these were not talks in Chicago and Los Angeles. These were talks in Paducah, Kentucky and Mobile, Alabama. He went to places that actors didn't normally go. And he spent time with young people, encouraging them to pursue their passions. And that, to me, is a generous life well lived. And celebrities don't do that so often now. It, it feels scary to be a celebrity. And so many celebrities don't want to go out and, and be hands-on. And that's been a big part of my legacy to continue to go out and meet people in small towns and share my dad's philosophy of living. Now, a lot of actors and actresses uh, dream of having their star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Your dad has two. Three. Three? three. There's a third one? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So motion picture, television, and what was the third? Radio. Radio. Uh, duh, I brought that up before. Why, why would I be surprised? <laughs> wow, 
three. I, can you do that? I thought you only got one. I didn't know. I that. think, you know, nobody thought celebrity was going to become this out of control industry. Now they're going to have to go, you know, up the Hollywood Hills with them. Uh, <laughs> but the, yeah, in those days. You were given a star for genuine contributions to the industry. I'm not suggesting that isn't the case now, uh, but there were less celebrities. It was more yeah. rare for there to be a celebrity. Now, now that's uh, not the case. And so, people who are really deserving of them, George Romero just got his star on the Hollywood uh, Walk of Fame. Just got a star, which is unconscionable. I think your father was the host of mystery on PBS for a very long time. And I, I used to watch mystery and I would always love the openings and closings because I, your father's voice really is good. Did he, um, well, I'm, I, it's really a super question. I was going to say, does he, did he enjoy doing it? And I'm sure he did, but, um, if he, hadn't gotten sick if he had lived do you think he would have continued on with mystery I, he would have loved to he loved both of the women who were the guiding lights bet- behind masterpiece and mystery theater and absolutely he would have loved to it was an honor to him he was a lifelong anglophile and it, he loved he loved promoting great great acting and great storytelling and great production values to American audiences. And I think they loved him. He made so much sense as the host of mystery. He definitely did. Your father was the, I'm going to say it, the best part of thriller. The oh. Michael Jackson bands don't shoot me, but yeah, uh, Vince, your dad was the best part of the music mm. video thriller or mm. the mini movie. Should I say? Thank you. You can't, hear Thriller without your father's voice. And again, we're back to the voice. He had such a great presence and the voice was a very major part of that. He had a great instrument. He did. And I think he, he, he saw it as that and he used it as that. You're listening to Mark. Oh, I, I, I am listening to Mark Who 42. Yeah, yes. you are listening to Mark Who 42. We're talking to Victoria Price, the daughter of the late, great Vincent Price. And I was going to say, we're up to the point of the show where we give our guest the place to talk about upcoming projects. And I know you have one coming up real soon. Yeah, I'm really excited and grateful about it. I have a book coming out February 14th, pretty much the best Valentine of my entire life. (laughs) And it's called The Way of Being Lost, A Road Trip to My Truest Self. And it's a book that I've wanted to write my whole life. In effect, I have been writing my whole life. I had this moment in 2011 where I was looking at myself in the mirror and I heard myself say to myself, wow, you know, you're doing everything right. And I listed all the things that I was doing right, where I was living and who I was living with and what I was doing for a living. And then I heard myself say, and you're miserable. And then the next thought that came to me was, and if I have to keep living like this for another 40 years, I won't make it. He just knew that. There was nothing wrong in terms of how my life looked. And there was everything wrong with how I felt inside myself. And I made a promise to myself that moment to begin to change my life. And as the universe often does, that year it provided me with the beginnings of this journey. That year was 2011, and it was or would have been my dad's 100th birthday. And there were these events all over the world that were dubbed the Vincentennial, which is so great. And I was, as his biographer and daughter, invited to speak at them. And so the thought came to me, you know, I'd done a book tour and I'd given talks about my dad for the book tour, but I didn't want to really do more talks about what he'd done with his life. So I decided to talk about how he lived his life. And in order to talk about how he lived his life, I had to begin to embody that in my own life. And I realized that the way he lived his life was with joy. He had the most joy-filled approach to life. He was 
generous, he was kind, he was curious, he was open-minded and open-hearted. Was he perfect? No. He was a workaholic. He was somebody who was fearful about money, uh, fearful about reputation. He was not a perfect man. But he lived his life with so much joy, and that joy connected him to other people and to the world. And it made him awake and alive and alert, and he was paying attention all the time. And when I was walking in his footsteps, I felt myself doing that. And then when that year came to an end, all of a sudden I thought, oh my God, how do I do that in my own life? That's what's missing. And so I embarked on this project of changing my life, and I ended up calling it the way of being lost because I realized I had to lose a lot of the stories that were all told about who we should be. And, you know, should is something imposed on us that kind of squelches down who we naturally are. And I had to lose all those old stories and be willing to figure out who I was, my truest self was, underneath that. And so over the course of the last seven years, bit by bit, I figured things out. It took me a long time, but I began writing a blog called Daily Practice of Joy, which was about learning how and still learning every day how to practice joy every day as a means of connecting and staying connected to the world. And eventually, I ended up writing this inspirational memoir called The Way of Being Lost. And on it, I talk about how I've now ended up being intentionally homeless, literally living on the road, because I felt like and I don't think this is something that most people would or want to do because it's scary and crazy sometimes. But I realized I had to be willing to throw everything out, to lose everything in order to really find my heart and my soul and my connection to being alive. And so that what that's what the book's about. And it'll be out. I'm going on a wonderful book tour. It's going to be a back roads book tour. So if any of your listeners are interested in having me come to their hometown, please email me because I'm putting together this book tour going not just to big cities. Yeah, I'm going to New York and LA, but I'm also going to smaller places where I think we all need to go to remember who we really are without all the um, pop and sizzle of the consumerist celebrity world. Where can they send the emails to? You can send an email to info at victoriaprice.com and the book is already available for pre-order on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. It's called The Way of Being Lost and pre-orders make such a difference to uh, books like this. So please, please think about pre-ordering it and uh, I'm going to be offering some really fun promotions to anybody who does pre-order the book between now and the time it comes out. So you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram at I'm Victoria Price. I am Victoria Price. And I will be having some fun, fun things that I'm doing uh, and workshops and classes and one-on-one coaching and counseling. So please reach out to me. I, uh, I'm also actually an interfaith and interspiritual minister, and I do a bunch of fun things, including Vincent Price-themed or horror-themed or goth-themed weddings and and rituals. Oh, Oh my God, that sounds awesome. Yes. uh, I mean, you want to talk about a pure shot of joy, uh, doing a a wedding for people with with a, a, a goth sensibility um, for horror fans who I've come to fall in love with. I never liked horror movies and I love horror fans now. (laughs) And a big part of the book is about how horror fans taught me who I really was and gave me permission to be my truest self. So part of it is a real love letter to horror fans as well. You are absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed this time with you. Wow. Thank you so much. And right back at you. I've had such a fun conversation. It's been a great way to spend the morning. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Victoria, for coming on to Barku 42. It has been such a pleasure. And I hope to meet you guys and anyone who's listening out there on the back roads one of these days. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Don't, Don't go away. away. Don't go away. We'll, we'll be back, back with more Marku 42 after this. I did my Christmas shopping, and I got my girlfriend the Peter Capaldi crystal carving at DoctorWhoCrystals.com. And you should go there, too. They've got official BBC-licensed crystal carvings of all the doctors inside of a crystal carving of a TARDIS. 
They are actual crystal, and they are beautiful. They've got every doctor to choose from, and they're only $100. They're not that expensive. So do what I did and get your spouse happy by buying them a crystal carving from DoctorWhoCrystals.com. You know, I might buy the War Doctor one for myself. Hello, I'm Nicholas Briggs, the voice of many monsters on Doctor Who and executive producer of Big Finish Productions. And I'm pleased to announce that Mark Who 42 books have joined forces with Big Finish to bring you Big Finish Audio. There's this fellow who calls himself the Doctor and he says he has saved me and we are in his time machine. You're all right. I think I've broken something. What about you? Yes, I'm fine, thanks. Mm, I rather think I broke your fall. Oh, sorry. Mark Who 42 Books will now offer to bring you the best in Big Finish audio. But why are they here? Hmm? How do you do? I beg your pardon. Oh, no need to. I'm the Doctor, and this is... I am Leela. By all means, please do come out to play, Doctor. I'm waiting for you. To find where Mark Who 42 books will be, go to markwho42.net or on their Facebook site at markwho42. What are you saying? They fizzled in somehow, like the TARDIS? Yeah, transmat from another dimension. The, the, the TARDIS doesn't fizzle. It's more of a... Also go to markwho42.net and download my interview with the team. You're executive producer at Big Finish Productions. Correct. Correct. Is this a quiz? Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. Jamie Engel is an award-winning author of science fiction and horror novels and stories. The Toilet Papers, a book that she wrote, is a collection of short stories ranging from 50 words to more than 5,000 to match your bathroom needs. But here are some other facts that you may not know about her. She cosplays Marty McFly Jr., Wonder Woman, Garth from Wayne's World, and Trinity from The Matrix. She speaks to kids about bullying and to authors about writing and marketing their books. She once owned a body shop, managed a hip-hop band, and danced at the Aloha Bowl halftime show. Wow, that's really cool. But without coffee... The world would end. So definitely you should read some of Jamie Engel's work. And you can if you go to her website, therightangle.com. T-H-E-W-R-I-T-E-E-N-G-L-E.com. And don't forget, follow her on Instagram at The Right Angle. Hi, this is Jason Connery, and you're listening to Mark Who 42. Welcome back to Mark Who 42. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten, and with me is Patricia Helm and Zion Kiros. We're here, and we just had a great interview with Victoria Price. We want to thank her so much for taking the time to do this. We've been trying to get her for an interview, dancing around, negotiating it. We finally got her, and it, I, I think, went very well. <sighs> Guys, you know, there are things called conventions. Have you ever been to one? <laughs> mm, many. Just, just a few. Just a few. Well, it's time for the Mark Who 42 Convention Spotlight. We're going to start with this weekend. This weekend in Tampa, Florida, is Time Lord Fest Tampa Bay. It's Florida's most exciting Doctor Who festival. And that's right. We use the word festival when we're talking Time Lord Fest not convention because it's a little different than a convention it's got more of a family feel it's more of a gathering of who fans to celebrate who and it's a convention too because there'll be dealers mark who 42 books will be there i'll be selling books and big finish audios including series five of torchwood and i've got several of the david tennant billy piper doctor who audios so stop by our booth for that it's going to be a great festival because not only do we have some of our guests who have come year after year but we've got some new people now robert alsop who is one of these people who designed the doctor who props and stuff he's come to him before we're actually going to have a teleconference with him he's going to be in england but we're going to talk to him and he's going to take us through 
his secret lair. So we'll get to see all these different props that he's worked on, and lucky patrons of this panel may even have a chance to wear some of the props that he's left behind with Ken Spivey, the guy running this festival, on his last visit. We also got Louis Robinson, the BBC producer who was involved with The Demon which was that great John Pertwee story with Unit, and, of course, The Master was in that. We've got Professor Cortland Lewis. Cortland Lewis is the author of Way of the Doctor, the Doctor Who's pocketbook guide to the good life, and co-editor of Doctor Who and Philosophy, and more Doctor Who and Philosophy. He's got a PhD. He's a really great guy. He's coming to this convention, too. There's a guy named Mark Baumgarten that just likes talking and saying his name, Mark Baumgarten. He's going to be there. But you know who else is going to be there? Yeah. Well, he's not really going to be there. He's going to be via teleconference, but it's going to be live from England. I was able for this festival to get Nicholas Briggs. Nice. Nick Briggs, the voice of the Daleks, the Cybermen, and many more Doctor Who villains, plus the driving force of Big Finish Productions. And we're going to have a nice conversation with him. I'll be leading that conversation. And I will open it up to the audience so that they can ask Nick questions, too, during this live teleconference that we're going to run. So you want to go to Time Lord Fest Tampa Bay. It's at the Event Factory in Tampa, Florida, from 11 to 7 on January 28th. That's this Sunday. The Ken Spivey Band will be performing there, too. Ken Spivey Band is the MTV and NPR-praised Time Lord rock band. General admission is $30 plus 7% sales tax. Students and military, if you have ID, you'll get in for $25 plus 7% Tampa sales tax. Or you can try to get pre-sale tickets in the last couple of days before the convention by going to Facebook and typing in Time Lord Test and using the Eventbrite link there. Oh, that's going to be such a great convention. Then, a few weeks later, Trish and I and Ed will be going, not as conventioneers, but as punters, I guess the word is, to Gallifrey One. Isn't that right, Trish? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm so excited. And I, I know you and Eddie are going to be going to a reception together. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to... Friday see. evening with Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred. And a few other no. people, including Wendy Padbury and some other... It's going to be a fun thing. And then I'm also going the following night to a little reception with Stephen Moffat, Matt Lucas, and some other people, including Chase Masterson, who we've had on the show. So it should be fun. It's a great convention. If you've never done Gallifrey, put it on your bucket list to try for next year. It is sold out. It sold out nine months ago. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm sorry. It sells out very fast. (laughs) It sells out within days, 48 hours, nine months before they sell out. Uh, but it, it's anyone who's going to Gallifrey One, Dan Harris will be running his table to uh, publicize the sci-fi sea cruise he does, the Doctor Who and Torchwood themed sea cruises he does. And every once in a while, I'll be there. And you can find literature on Mark Who 42 at that table as well. But it's going to be a great convention. And then when I get home, I'll have to go back to work immediately go to another convention, Comic-Con Revolution in West Palm Beach. I am going to be there on February 24th. It is a Saturday. Can you believe a one-day convention on a Saturday instead of a Sunday? That's unheard of, but it's going to be fun. And there are going to be some great guests there, including Chris Claremont, the guy who brought back the X-Men. You wouldn't have X-Men movies if it wasn't for Chris Claremont. Patrick Broderick will be there. Ming Chen from AMC's Comic Book Men will be there. Who else will be there? Oh, so many people like Greg Land. Oh, Mark Who 42 will be there. I wonder who those people are. Oh, I said that. Me, Mark Baumgart. God, I like saying my name, don't I? The 1989 Batmobile will be there, and I will interview that car. I'm not really sure what answers I'll get. Probably vroom vroom and beep beep. Yeah, and maybe, maybe some weird high-pitched beeping noise if I pressed the wrong button. And if you are a fan of Nickelodeon's Henry Danger or Netflix Daredevil, Tommy Walker will be a guest at this time. So please stop on by. We've got other conventions coming up 
in the near future that we will talk about soon as we get all the dots in a row. Well, guys, uh, it's been another amazing show. Victoria Price was a great guest. Do you have any final words? I finally got through the East Base Trilogy. You got through the East... Uh, that's not really something to applaud. You should have got through the East Base Trilogy years ago. I'm sorry. Uh, it sorry. is. <laughs> it was, it's awful. I, I, look, if I could write so much... Hey. Hey, about I don't not like liking Adric. this trilogy. I'm on your side. I'm on your side. No, no. I don't like Adric. He, here's the funny part. The one serial that I enjoyed the most was when Adric first showed up. Oh, the only one where he was written properly? Or yes. Sh- oh, I love the marsh. The marsh, it's, it's, it's getting foggy. Oh, no. We're all going to go. Ah. What's that? What's that? Full circle? <laughs> Full circle. Yeah, by Andrew Smith, who writes new stories for Big Finish now. He was a kid when he wrote that story. Really? Wow. He was like 17 or 18 when he wrote Full Circle. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, um... That was the only one that they wrote Adric correctly in. I didn't like Warrior's Gate. I uh, I saw no reason why Romana stayed with the Lion people. Yeah, that is sad. But did you understand Warrior's Gate? Or did you need to go back a few times? Kind of like Ghost Life to understand it. Probably I need to do that. Go, but back, def- go back and watch Warriors Gate again, because it's actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good. Trish, any final words? Mm. Go Jaguars? No, I don't know. There you go. Go Jaguars. Sorry. <laughs> oh. oh, no. We have sports on our mind. Sports uh, ball. Oh, no. no. Oh, you know what? If Manchester United can just... No, anyway. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, guys, that's all the time we have for this week's Mark Who 42. I hope you enjoyed it. Victoria Price, great guest. I wish I could have met her father, Vincent, while he was alive. But, you know, talking to Victoria, I feel like I didn't meet Vincent. It was really cool. So until next time, have TARDIS will travel. Bye, everyone, from Mark Who 42 to you. Bye. Mark Who 42 has been written and presented by Mark Baumgarten, Iggy Matthews, Ken Spivey, Zion Heroes, and Trish Helm Fryer. This episode was edited, directed, and produced by Mark Baumgarten. Visit MarkWho42.net where you can register and become part of the Hooniverse Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at markhoo42, subject line, question mark. You can have Mark Who 42 entertain at your next event or convention. Go to heroesonhand.com slash markhoo42. Space Coast Comics is a free monthly magazine found in over 120 locations currently throughout Brevard County, parts of Osceola, Belusia, and Indian River County in Florida, and available in Chicago. Follow them on Facebook to learn more. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Mark Who 42 is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2018. This is Krypton Radio.